Welcome back. It's Banfield and Ford courtside, minus one very important component. That would be the Ford part. He's off today, so you're stuck with just me. Well, I don't know if you uh, heard the news, but it was pretty big here. The Phil Spector trial, you know that trial we've been covering for the better part of half a year? Well, it's over, and it sort of landed with a thud, and here is the final picture that I want to leave you with. That's Phil Spector as he shows absolutely no reaction to the news that the jury in his case is deadlocked and that it is in fact a mistrial. Split 10 to 2, can't come together, can't get those two to come around, certainly can't get the 10 to come around, and that's the reaction from Mr. Spector. I personally think perhaps he should have been dancing a jig. He did later, apparently, because this for him is a victory. He is free on bond. He's back at the castle, hanging out with his haughty wife, and he gets another reprieve. However long it takes for the uh, prosecutors to put together an, another case against him, if they so decide, they've indicated they will, but if they so decide, they're going to put another case together, he'll be back in a courtroom, and you just know we're going to be there. We have two fabulous guests joining us live from Los Angeles. Michelle Ward, she's a jury consultant. She worked for the Phil Spector defense team. Michelle is also under contract with Court TV. And sitting next to her is criminal defense attorney Ben Pesta, who you'll know from our coverage as well, is a former journalist who has written for Rolling Stone and Craw Daddy, so he's got a lot of insight, not only as as an attorney and a smart one at that, but also a journalist and a smart one at that. Thank you both for being here. Let me start with you, Ms. Ward. I have been very, very hard on Mr. Spector because I don't think he's a likable man given all the evidence we've heard, given how he behaves, given how he's treated people. So I apologize if you don't like me for not liking the guy you worked for. But my God, you must be real good at what you do for a living because you got a 10-2. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Richard and I were very pleased with the results, but it's, uh, it was definitely a tough case. So let me ask you, what was it exactly that you uh, read into the panel that you chose? And I'm sorry if this is taxing your memory, because it was a good six months ago. But think back, if you will, to that process you went through. What did you see in these panelists that you liked? Well, to be honest with you, I I'm going to say the same thing I've said over and over again. We wanted a smart panel. We wanted a panel that would look at the forensics, that would be critical when, when it weighing this evidence. And, and that's exactly what we ended up with. People who took this duty seriously, and they came up with their own conclusions. And by golly, they stuck with them. And, you, and you, prepared, you prepared the questionnaire, right? Yes, Richard and I did, yes. Okay. Um, now, I don't want to be rude, but we have already had guests on the program saying that um, when you say smart juror, some people might have referred to one of those jurors as a bit of a smart ass. And I'm not going to suggest that, but I will say he did seem like a bit of a know-it-all. And I'm referring to juror number 10, who I believe at this point we can almost say is the entire reason we're at this impasse. We did have 11 to 1, and he was the one who was holding out against a conviction against Mr. Spector. Um, and I got the impression, Ms. Ward, that that juror, who remains nameless, was a bit of a smart ass um, in that he seemed in his post trial news conference to have an air about him that he was smarter than everyone else. Give me your read. Well, I'd first like to say I, I, I want to give a big thank you to these jurors. I mean, what an amazing commitment and amazing job they did. Amen. And I respect them and, and really appreciate the time. I mean, their lives were put on hold for as long as, as this case was going on. And, you know, I don't, I think. It, it's, it's rough for them, you know, They're, they have to stick to their guns and, and there's a lot of pressure in that jury room and, and people took this job seriously and, and it, clearly he did too and he believed in what he believed and he had to stand up against a lot of people who felt differently. So my hat's really off to and, and that's actually what the process is supposed to be. It's not that the law allows for that, for jurors to disagree and that's what happened in this No, you're case. right, you're right, Michelle, and I will not challenge you on that, but I will challenge you here <laughs> that some of the back, uh, backroom reporting and conversation and discussion about this case has led to several people under the consensus that perhaps juror number 10 was holding the prosecution to a higher burden than the one he is legally supposed to hold them to, which would be reasonable doubt. We all know that when you go into a jury room, you are supposed to use reasonable doubt as your barometer, not beyond shadow of a doubt. Do you agree? Well, let's back up a little bit. We didn't really have a 10 to 2. Originally, we had a 7 to 5. Before jury until instruction number 3 was taken. Yeah, that's gotcha. right. And that is not a slam dunk. That's a, that's a solidly hung jury. So 
backing up a little bit, there were lots of people in that jury room who had reasonable doubt. And I'm going to challenge you, Michelle. I'm going to challenge you. Given some Special scenarios. instruction number three turned out to be something that the judge could not allow them to continue on with. He said it wouldn't be legal, that it was a mistake. So given the fact that we corrected what was legally a mistake and went on with the process that was appropriate, we had, a, we had an 11 to 1, ma'am. Well, I would have to argue that they were given scenarios that included Lana Clarkson having the gun in her hand, and none of those were, some of the scenarios were never even put forth in evidence. So I really consider it a seven to five hang. Oh, because look at of you. The, <laughs> I do. You're I adorable. Do, Richard and I. <laughs> You're just well, adorable. <laughs> let me get let me get your partner. You know, I feel strongly. Uh, let me get Ben Pasta in on this as well because Ben has been uh, has been kind enough to sit with us throughout this whole trial. He's been watching it day to day, and he's got that added bonus of having the inside track on the music industry since you are a music journalist as well. Um, ben, first of all, your reaction. Well. It's a victory for the defense. It's a defeat for the prosecution. The prosecution failed to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. But, of course, they're going to go back in for a retrial. The district attorney's office is one in which the line prosecutors are civil servants, but the DA himself is an elected official, and you don't get reelected by abandoning publicity cases. Do you think that juror number 10 was being unreasonable, Mr. Pesta? Uh, no, I don't. I have to tell you, I didn't see his press conference, but uh, there were two holdouts. And again, until the judge applied the uh, verdict suppository of the revised jury instruction, it was seven to five, which is almost as bad a hang as you can get. No, oh, I agree. Seven to five sounded like we were uh, we were at an impasse several weeks ago. I, I agree with you there. I was absolutely stunned when the news came out that it had changed as much as it has. Shelley Albert, uh, weigh in on this. Um, you know, I'm being really, really hard on juror number 10, and I should not be, only because he should be applauded for what he's done over the last almost six months. Now, listen, it, it, I, look, I couldn't do six months in that situation being, by the way, as a journalist, being held back from knowing right. certain things and being stuck in a room while they're all hashing out legal issues that don't apply to me. Mm -hmm. So it would be very difficult and be very frustrating. And I can imagine that after 46 plus hours um, haggling it out with people heretofore you'd never met, right. it can't be fun. So I applaud every single one of these jurors, number one, number 10, all of them, all the alternates for what they did. And if you're watching, thank you, bless you for doing what you did. And I would like to be able to be a juror as well one day. Um, but in the same sense, I can't get around the fact that there is this issue of being reasonable. And we're all right. forgetting what it means to be reasonable. Well, let's not forget, though, what Mr. Enrique said. He really shed a lot of light on this for us. He didn't say that he, he, he was talking about it. He didn't get into any specifics with us, but he did say that presumably was referring to juror number 10, that he did have an argument for everything, everything that they brought to him, he did have something to counter it with. So what he believes in his mind reasonably, and I'm trying to give juror number 10 the benefit of a doubt, sure. I, I mean, he, it, Mr. Enrique seemed to be an incredibly intelligent, very genuine person. I, and he, you could tell he was a little frustrated and was holding back, or at least yeah. that was my impression from him. I think that if juror number 10 um, I think that if he truly was unreasonable and was sitting in a court and was refusing to talk and saying, you know, no, this is my opinion, or however he, you know, belligerent were envisioning he was being, I think Mr. Enriquez might have told us that. So, you know, there were experts that testified in this trial. Let's not forget, it wasn't a complete 100% slam dunk. There was a question as to, you know, what I thought was the most compelling evidence was the evidence from the, the driver when Phil Spector runs out of the house. I could never get past that in that case. That would have been enough for me to convict. Now, I didn't sit through the whole trial. But to me, that was incredibly compelling. But there was a statement, and even another juror brought it up when he was talking on air. There was a statement about he did have trouble with the English language. Maybe he didn't hear it. He all the had way. trouble with people understanding him. Right, not understanding. He didn't have any problem understanding. Oh no, I get what you're else. saying. But the the point that I'm trying to make is that it seems that that juror could have articulated sure. at least some things that gave him trouble. He wasn't just saying, you know, I'm not going to talk to you people. Sure, <laughs> sure. Let me go around the horn on this one, and I'll start with you, Ben Pesta. I kind of felt as though perhaps if the prosecution had, well, there's so many things in summation that I would have loved for them to, to stress, and that is, people, please, when you go back there, let me just leave this with you. Be reasonable. Don't get mired in the minutia. Dominic Dunn said it. This guy might have gotten so mired in the minutia of the case that he forgot to be a human being and think about what it means to be reasonable. But I also wonder, Ben, if the prosecution should not have said, hey, if you're all hung up on the science, 
of this case, if you think that it's science that's going to stop you from being reasonable, let me just tell you this. We've had a lot of experts out here that all have a different theory. So how reliable is science if everyone can be so opposed? Do you think that would have made a difference, Ben? Ashley, you can bet that on the retrial, the prosecution is going to spend much less time on the science, especially the dubious inchoate science of spatter pattern analysis. The prosecution's weak point was the science. The defense's weak point was Spectre himself. And the prosecution is going to recognize that, and you'll see a different lineup and a different evidentiary presentation on the retrial, you can bet. Well, first of all, you, you lost me at dubious in Kuwait science. You're brilliant, and I am monosyllabic. So, Shelly, <laughs> Shelly, weigh in on this. Do you feel the same way? Um, <laughs> what is dubious in Kuwait science? <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> Maybe ben, I need to go back to L.A. Get back here. What, what the heck is that? <laughs> what is it, Ben? Spatter pattern, spatter pattern analysis isn't going to convict anybody, Ashley. And on the retrial, I believe the prosecution is going to spend a lot less time on the forensics. Ah, okay. So, and, and I would wonder if they, I mean, this is, of course, Jamie Floyd puts it very eloquently when she says this was the dress rehearsal. Right. They now have the right. hand completely tipped. The defense has, I don't know, any other cards? Yeah. Do they have any other well, cards? Well, you better believe that everybody's going to be listening to what these jurors had to say. And let's also not forget another juror besides Mr. Enriquez came out and said they would have liked to have seen more psychological insight into Lana. I thought that was really interesting because to me, the jurors were at least considering that theory yep. that she went to some guy's house that she just met that night and decided that's when she was going to offer something well, that she was depressed I never bought, and that she'd written before oh I gosh never bought how that. many times have I said coming yeah. into work when I'm exhausted on a Monday morning god I wish I could just find the nearest bridge <laughs> I say it all the time especially right. when I was 10 months pregnant right. I've had enough of this <laughs> this rots uh, blah. I mean we all make these kinds of things these they're kind of innocuous statements to mm -hmm. a lot of people but um, look we, we could go on and on about that but all I needed to know was that she had her purse on her shoulder and she bought seven pairs of shoes the day before. Right. No, nobody's going to commit suicide if they're buying seven pairs of shoes the day before and they've got the purse on the shoulder ready to go. Some more women especially on the jury. Yeah, especially when five women right. all had their purses on their shoulders right. ready to go. Mm -hmm. Come on, what does it take? Ben, what does it take? I mean, did, do you think that perhaps they just forgot that all of these five women who had the same exact story, who, by the way, had not met each other nor colluded to get their story similar, who, by the way, spanned 30 years, could they just not get around the fact that it had happened so many times before and it, those women weren't suicidal? They didn't just forget, Ashley, it had happened so many times before and he'd never pulled the trigger. Or maybe he had and it wasn't loaded and this time, oh, I came back from the range and forgot to empty it. And then, uh, you know, as the, as the prosecution contends, wiped off, wiped off all of the DNA, his DNA and gunshot residue as well. Um, Michelle Ward, come on back in here. Are you going to work for this team again? Because by all accounts, the prosecutor wants to have another go at this. He even said so much. They have to confer, obviously. But he did say, yeah, you're damn right I want to do this again. Would you be on the team again? To be honest with you, Ashley, we do not know, and decision analysis is not we're, not, we're no longer under retainer with the defense team right now. So I, to be honest with you, I have no idea. If you were, okay, and this is our closing moment, if you were, what more would you be able to look for now that the cat's out of the bag, Ms. Ward? Well, I actually appreciate the fact that the cat's out of the bag. We know what, what really stuck with jurors. We know what what we needed to work better on and, and what the, our strengths and our vulnerabilities were. And it, it's certainly more of an information. And, and it takes all the speculation out of it. I mean, at the end of the day, it's the evidence that has to be important here. And, and, and we certainly know what got through to them and, and what perhaps did not so much. OK, well, uh, hold that thought for a moment. I got to squeeze in a quick break, but not before I tell you that uh, at some point, a little bit later on in the program, we're going to do the battle of the experts. Was this just information overload? Did so much spaghetti get thrown at these jurors that they couldn't see the forest for the trees? I'm mixing too many metaphors. We'll be back after this. said it was a man's world never met these women come on it's got his book meet miami's bounty girls come out of the house with your hands up 
The brains. You're looking for more information, you lead. The broad. We're gonna have to taser this guy. The bay. Well, bring him out with my big, sexy, luring waves. And the boss. What the happened? Four real women, one mean team. I'm gonna take somebody down tonight. Bounty Girls Miami, an all new episode tonight at 10 on Court TV. I'm Mark Goldston, Chairman and CEO of Net Zero. All internet providers take you to the same internet, so why pay more to get there? Net Zero is only $9.95 a month, and we give you a 30 day money back guarantee. Call 1 800 Net Zero or visit netzero.com. Hey, there's that Bamzoo spot. Oh, I love Bamzoo.com. Bamzoo has many of the great products advertised on Turner Broadcasting. It's easy to shop online. No run into stores or remembering phone numbers. Just log on. You know, we could do a Bamzoo commercial. <laughs> you think? I might break a few too many rules, but someday I'm going to change them. Kids with ADHD are sometimes known for their disability, but someday they could be known for their abilities. Sometimes I disrupt class, but someday I'll disrupt conventional thinking. As a parent, you know your child with ADHD has unique talents, and you wish the whole world could see them the way you do. You also know that treatment is helping, but is there something else you can do? Well, now there's a free ADHD Roadmap to Success Kit designed by both professional ADHD coaches and moms. For yours, call 1-800-616-4185 and see why a kid that doesn't always sit still today could be going places. I don't always follow directions, but someday I'll be on the board of directors. This new kit gives you a four-step roadmap for your ADHD child to help keep them consistently moving towards success. It starts by taking a snapshot of where your child is today, identifying strengths and areas for improvement. Then it helps you map out a success plan, setting realistic and meaningful goals. Step three lets you take action with practical tips to help your child achieve their goals by working with teachers to help them do their best every day. Plus 10 tips to help improve focus, organization, and behavior at school and at home. Finally, a goal tracker helps you track and reward your child's success, letting you actually see their progress towards each milestone. So you know you're helping your child succeed and someday maybe exceed. I wasn't picked first on the team, but someday I'm going to own one. For your free ADHD Roadmap to Success Kit, call 1-800-616-4185-MAN or visit ADHDRoadmap.com. It could make a real difference for your child today and tomorrow. I have a little trouble in school, but someday I just might teach the world something. Fact. You're receiving a structured settlement from a lawsuit. Fact. It's being paid out over years. Question. Should you wait to get your money down the road? Or get a cash lump sum now. Call Peachtree Settlement Funding. Get cash for credit cards, medical bills, or a down payment on a house. No one has more expertise than Peachtree in turning your structured settlement into cash today. And that's a fact. Life doesn't wait. Why should you? Call now, 1-800-444-9634. Welcome back to Banfield and Ford Courtside. Missing Jack Ford today, and what a day. I wish he were here because this is one of our luckiest days, I might say, ever on this program. It is rare when our booking department, all of a sudden, mid-program, has the opportunity to provide a guest to join me live, who I have been speaking about this whole program. I am referring to juror number 10. Juror number 10 is joining me now live on the telephone from Los Angeles. And I know I'm not supposed to say your name, nor do I even know it, so there's no chance for a slip up. Uh, you have every right to privacy, sir, but I'm wondering if you know how tough I have been on you in this program. I don't know how tough you've been on me because I'm not listening. Okay, I have been very tough. I feel as though, and I'm not the only one, that perhaps you might be the sole reason we're at this impasse because we were at 11 to 1 at one point, and uh, other jurors have said there was just no convincing you no matter what evidence came in. Uh, that's interesting. But is it accurate or is it inaccurate? I would say we were never at 11 to 1. Really? Yes. Juror number one was never on the side of conviction? No. We've heard otherwise, sir. We've heard other jurors say that there was a, a moment when she was uh, leaning towards a conviction and that you swayed her back to your side. 
uh, I would say that wasn't swaying. She was. She said that she would go with the crowd under pressure, but that she didn't really feel that that was the the right decision for her. And all I said was, you can't let the pressure sway you. If, if that's not your decision, then it could be 11 to 1, and you need to decide what your vote is. And she made her own decision. I, I want to I want to say, sir, um, thank you for starters for your service. Every juror on that panel gave us yeoman service in the last six months, almost six months. You have done your duty, and we so appreciate it. Despite the fact that I've been ripping into you, because I feel as others do that perhaps you were too caught up in the minutia to be reasonable about the bigger picture in this case. Please tell me I'm wrong, and tell me why. I could tell you you're wrong. Um, the, you know, I'm, I really am not interested in discussing my verdict. Uh, I can tell you that the discussion re revolved around all of the facts for all of the jury, and that each juror decided which facts would weigh more heavily than others. And for some, drawing the line between Adriano de Souza and, and the five women in the past was not as easy as for others. These five women to you, sir, were not convincing that perhaps this man basically had a buy on 30 years, that, that basically nothing had happened by the grace of God, that a, that a gun hadn't gone off five different times beforehand, and then eventually with Lana it did. They were all in the same exact situation. They were all at a door waiting to leave after a certain kind of romantic encounter. Is it not reasonable to believe that just this once the gun finally went off? Uh, as far as I know, that misstates the evidence that was given. Uh, we believed, as a jury, that the five women did experience uh, those actions by Phil Spector. How, I'm sorry, you got to clear it up for me. What do you mean that evidence is misstated? I, I'm, I'm accounting for exactly what happened on the stand. Each, five women told the same story of being in a romantic encounter, either at a hotel room or his home, and they were barred from leaving, and he brought a gun to their faces. It was almost identical, each one all, of them. All five women did not testify that they were romantic encounters. Well, they, I, I, you know what, I, I'll defer to you this moment because I haven't got the transcript in front of me, but as I understood it, they were rebuffing what might have been a romantic encounter had Phil Spector got his way. I guess you could look at it that way. So with that M.O., sir, again, I'm asking you to be reasonable about this. With the M.O. that was outlined five different times, and I hate to be the one to, to, to break this to you if you don't already know, there were a number of other incidents that weren't even allowed into evidence that mimicked almost the exact same kind of thing, him bringing up guns into people's faces and threatening to kill them. Uh, but with these five that you did see, all women trying to leave probably late night, it sounds identical to Lana, but yet you think for some reason Lana, in the middle of the night after her shift, would meet a man she'd never known before and decide to commit suicide, just sort of like that. How, how did you arrive at that? Well, to be honest, uh, it wasn't that easy. And I think those jurors who felt that this verdict was not a shut case, evaluated more than just the women and De Souza's statement. Were you, were you hung up on the science, that, what the defense presented to you? By the way, I will tell you that one of your fellow jurors said they were insulted by the case that was brought to them by the defense because they felt that it was just irrational. But were you hung up on the science that perhaps what Linda Kenny Bodden showed you with gunshot residue and blood spatter pattern, it's entirely plausible that Lana was the one who shot the gun into her own mouth willingly? I wouldn't say I was hung up on the science. Um, in fact, 
as a jury, we decided not to use the defense's witnesses in our deliberations. What? That's right. How so? We didn't believe them. So they, beca they became incredible to us. To you as well? To all of us. Really? So we went back, when we talked about the science, we actually talked about the prosecution science. And, and so what was it about the prosecution's science that you didn't believe? Well, there's nothing about the prosecution's science. Uh, and you keep going back to the, what you didn't believe, you know. Well, tell, no, you know what, let me not put words in your mouth. Tell me what it was that hung you up and convinced you that Phil Spector was not the killer. Well, you're, you know, I don't know what, what's been said on the radio, so, you know, maybe I'm at a disadvantage here. No, but you're absolutely at an advantage. The platform is yours. We are not editing. The, we are, we're live, and you can say your piece. I know, but I, I haven't heard what the other jurors have said. To my recollection, I've never said which way I voted. Uh, it's understood that juror number 10, which is you, and juror number one were the two holdouts for a conviction. Well, that, that would be uh, thanks to my friends then. Um, I wasn't really ready to discuss this. I think I had mentioned that on the phone already. I, I don't want to put you in. So, a, I don't want to put uh, you in a, in a difficult situation. I definitely don't. I, I I thought you were joining me to to tell you why. Uh, no, to legitimize uh, I, I was, why I was you made joining you made. to talk about celebrity justice. Okay. Well, all right. Let me switch gears for a moment uh, because we've all covered this at Court TV cut its teeth, I hate to say, on the O.J. case, and we followed mm -hmm. Robert Blake, and we followed Michael Jackson, and there are a lot of people who follow us who have said, what on earth does it take to get a conviction of a celebrity in Los Angeles? I'd love to hear your take. It takes a case, and to be honest, the, the fact that Phil Spector was a celebrity never entered into the discussion of the of the jury room. Phil Spector was just another man with a history. Lana Clarkson was another woman with a history. And we tried to wade through the five months of shoveling that had been done by both sides to bring the case to court. Can I ask you if I can indulge you uh, sure. in, in something Indulge me. <laughs> not that you haven't spent you know the better part of a year <laughs> listening to evidence but I mentioned to you that there was a lot of material that didn't make it into court facts not in evidence as we call it yeah um, and we're a little baffled at some of us others not at all because of strategy that the prosecution did not bring in some evidence that the prosecution was allowed to bring in and chose not to they were statements made by Phil Spector shortly after Lana uh, died he was interviewed by police right there on the scene, and then he was taken down to the station and he was interviewed again. We don't have the tape, but we have the transcript. And I want to read a couple of things for you and see if this has any effect on you. Spectre said, the gun went off accidentally. She works at the House of Blues. It was a mistake. I don't understand what the expletive, you, what's wrong with you people, that you people, you know, what's wrong with you? I'm sorry this happened. I don't know how it happened. It scared the blank out of me that it happened. Um, he was asked, uh, he was told, you were arrested for murder. And Spectre's response was, of whom? As if to say he didn't even know that there was a dead woman in his uh, foyer at the time. The detective says uh, about his assistant, about uh, Phil's assistant trying to get Phil a lawyer, she said she can get Robert Shapiro for you. And Spectre says, I want him down here. I'm going to make you blank people pay for this. This is blank and you can insert all f-bombs and s-bombs uh, sure that you I want could. in there but my god was this man belligerent he even went on to call Lana Clarkson a piece of you know what to the police and that she just has no right to come to my castle and blow her effing head off I mean he was just despicable uh, in these interviews would this have made any difference to you if you had been privy to this uh, material you know that that's interesting uh, if I had been privy to that that whole statement um, 
in full, if that was what you just read to me? Yes. I could argue that one both ways. Really? Yeah. The, the, the fact that she's, he pulled, it went off accidentally, whatever, okay, it was in his hand. She has no right to blow her brains out in my house. It went off in her hand. Was it an accident? What about how derogatory he was about her? You know, I dislike that. That that language is, to me personally, repulsive. Would it have changed your mind? I know people that talk like that, and I don't like it. But that doesn't always mean that it's... It's more of a habit sometimes, as bad of a habit as that is and as repulsive as it is. So I, the, the expletives by themselves, while reprehensible, are, are not enough to convict a person. Was there anything the prosecutors could have done, sir, to convince you otherwise? There are things the prosecution could have done, I think, to improve their case. Like and what? And I will talk to them about that um, later. You will? Yes. I, I've got uh, the prosecution's phone numbers. I've got the defense lawyer's phone numbers. I talked to them briefly yesterday. The, well. the difficulty in the jury room stems from, from a few key pieces of evidence for some jurors, again, not all jurors weighed the evidence the same. And both sides have ways that they can improve their cases. The jury's job is to weigh the evidence that's presented to them and decide, did the prosecution meet their burden of proof? And that was explained to us all through the Wadir process. That was explained to us through opening statements. It was explained to us through the trial and through the closing arguments. You know what their burden is, though, right? That burden is a, a reasonable, reasonable doubt, re not re beyond shadow of a doubt. Reasonable doubt. Exactly. Reasonable. And, and you saw the judge's instructions. We, we came back out 7 to 5. We discussed what reasonable was, and the judge said each juror has to decide what reasonable is. And so some jurors who brought that up felt like if they brought it up, the judge would tell us that, you know, collectively, the if everybody's reasonable on the jury, then maybe the holdout is unreasonable. And well, when the judge came back, that wasn't the instruction. Each person has to decide what reasonable is. And so the two that decided not to discuss, or not to, uh, the, the, uh, hold on, let me collect my thought. Well, I, I, have to, I have to get to a break. It's that nasty thing that That's happens fine. in television. I'll collect but, my thought over the but break. But you know what? What I, what I want to say to you is that I think you and I have very different um, philosophies about what reasonable behavior is. And I, and I think perhaps there are other people on the jury who feel the same way. Um, that said, I have tremendous respect for you and a great deal of thanks for your service because that was a big job and it was an important job and it was a crucial job and thank God that we have this system in the United States because there are other countries where summary justice happens in the town square with a machete. I've witnessed it. It ain't pleasant. So sir, and you shall remain nameless, I do want to thank you again for your time, for your candor and um, I look forward to hearing more from you uh, after you've been able to enlighten the prosecutors about your process. Thank you. Thank you. And I also want to thank Michelle Ward who joined us live outside uh, the, uh, the courthouse in Los Angeles. Um, you did a good Good job, young lady, and I'll be looking forward to finding out if you're back on the team for round two, if in fact there is a round two. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. We have to squeeze in that quick break, and we're back right after this. Whoever said it was a man's world never met these women. Come on, it's gone, it's gone. Meet Miami's Bounty Girls. Come out of the house with your hands up. 
the brains. You're looking for more information, you lead. The brawn. We're going to have to teaser this guy. The bay. Well, bring him out with my big sex. To your because of the. I can't recommend it strongly enough. Hover around will make a big difference in the quality of your life. Call right now and find out you should get. Number one home loan. No, Phil Spector as well. We have very forward courtside. We are very. Today at three. Live on Court TV. Welcome back to Banfield and Ford Courtside. We are very lucky at this juncture to be joined by uh, Rob Fraboni, who is a friend of Lana Clarkson's and also just happened to know Phil Spector as well. We have very few guests who actually cross into both the paths of these people, Rob. So thank you for being with us. You're um, and right off the bat, we've been focusing a lot in this sort of post verdict confab about Mr. Spector and about the strategies and the jurors. And very little focus has been on the victim in this case, on Lana Clarkson. Dominic Dunn alluded to her. She died. She died hideously. And yep. that almost is getting lost in this whole story. Bring it back. Bring it back and tell me about her. Well, she's, uh, she's, she was a really, really kind uh, uh, person with a great sense of humor and a lot of talent and was somebody that was really working really hard to try to make it. You know, she had done her movies and such and she was working on her stand-up comedy routine. But uh, she had really entered a period of her life where she'd gotten really into spiritual things and uh, she was, I'd, I'd say that had been going on for about five years. and. She had, she had, you know, gone through her wild period to some extent, but not not anything. Uh, Who of us hasn't, huh? Yeah, not yeah, exactly. Not Rob, anything out of the ordinary. Were you were you the last person potentially to ever hear her voice on your on your voicemail that that fateful night at Well, that's possible. It's funny. I think the last two people that she spoke to that she knew were my wife and then me. She called my wife to find out where I was, and then uh, I happened to be on a plane to L.A. when she called, and then. I was flying into Long Beach. I went to see my sister, and I landed at night at 9:30, and I had a voicemail from Lana saying that she was having trouble with her earpiece that she uh, used at the House of Blues for the intercom, and uh, she said, "If anybody could help me figure this out, maybe you could." But the next thing you hear is on the news, uh, well, the, and no, confirmation of your family that she's the victim. Well, what happened actually was that. Uh, that night, I left my sister's at about 12:30, just after midnight, and I considered going by the House of Blues. This is the nice night it happened, and then I thought, well, I should get some sleep. I got a lot to do tomorrow, and I and I ended up going home. Well, I bet you wish you'd done something different. Yeah, there, huh? you're right about that. But anyway, so then the whole next day, you just continually heard about Phil Spector killing this woman, but you didn't know who it was. Uh, we should say allegedly, sir. Careful. Well, right. <laughs> I'm just well, allegedly yeah. killing yeah. this woman. Yeah. That's true. Let me just ask you, you're friends with her family, too. Right. Have you had a chance to talk to them since all of this went down yesterday? I, uh, not, since I t not since yesterday. I, was, I talked to a very close friend, of a mutual close friend of ours that was with them, but I didn't speak to them. How are they? Uh, they're a bit upset. You know, I mean, it's just the idea of having to go through all this again. You know, it's just it's pretty hard to take. Funny, my, my partner, Jack Ford, said yesterday, would they want to go through all of this all over again and have to rehash all these horrible memories? And my reaction was, hell yeah. Would well, that be the, would well, that be the well, right one? They will, but they're afraid, too, that since so much of the information is out on the table, I mean, from both sides, it kind of makes things a bit, you know, it's, it's not what it was. It's not as neutral as it was when it started the first time. So they're a bit concerned about that. And, uh, well, that can cut both ways. Yeah, that's right. It could cut both ways. And uh, I, I mean, hopefully, <laughs> who knows? But I mean, Rob, can they sit through it again? Can they cope with this whole thing all over again? Yeah, they're they're determined. You know, they're strong people. Her mother's Donna is really a, a strong character, has strong character, and and Fawn, her sister, and her, and her brother both loved her dearly. And I mean, they they're gonna you know. They're going to hang into the bitter until justice is done, as far as they're concerned. And we certain ha uh, certainly have a, a pattern in Los Angeles of criminal trials not potentially going the way of the prosecution, Boy, but the, the civil trials do go the way of the plaintiffs. Um, did, have they talked to you at all about their hopes uh, for bringing the civil trial, this wrongful death suit, uh, forward, and how quickly they want to do that? Yes, they when, well, it's, they suppose they, it was supposedly going to start. Uh, relatively soon, but they're afraid that be now they're finding out on October 3rd, they told me, that when the retrial is going to be. Mm -hmm. So they're a bit concerned about, you know, that being postponed because of that. So, you know, they're ready to 
get into it, though. This and I guess as we, as we all know, Rob, you don't necessarily even need uh, a conviction or an exoneration to be successful in the civil trial. So maybe they'll just go ahead with it before we ever get back into criminal court. Right. If they, I mean, if, I think if they have the choice, that's what they would choose. I'm just not sure if they have the choice or if the court determines that. All right. Well, listen, Rob, thank you for taking the time to, uh, to talk to us and for, for giving another face to this, to this tragic victim uh, in this horrible crime. And, yeah, uh, we'll, I miss we'll, we'll, her. Yeah, I think we all do. We've all come to get to know her a little yeah, bit. Yeah, she was a sweetheart. In our own way. Rob Fraboni, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it and okay. love your comments, too. Uh, quick break. Coming back with some very bizarre video. We alluded to it earlier in the show. In fact, it was Dominic Dunn who alluded to it. Uh, we're going out with some pictures, however, of Lana Clarkson in her better days. Beautiful, beautiful Lana Clarkson. Say what you will about her acting or her comedy. A lot of people liked it. A lot of people liked her. And she was lovely. We'll be right back after this. From the creator of Cops. We have the product. For a small party. All right. Inside American Jail. You on fire, man. An all new episode. Thanks for arresting us. Premieres tonight at 8 30 on Court TV. Fosamax is a medication primarily used to promote bone growth in patients suffering from osteoporosis. According to a recent study, Fosamax has been linked to the degenerative bone condition commonly known as dead jaw. Symptoms of dead jaw can include exposed bone, loose teeth, and significant chronic pain. If you or someone you know has taken Fosamax and experienced unexplained jaw deterioration, call our lawyers at 800-579-2913. Would you like to learn how to get the most cash for your structured settlement or annuity payments? I'm here to tell you that J.G. Wentworth can provide the most cash right now for those monthly insurance payments. J.G. Wentworth helps thousands of people just like you get the cash they need today. It's your money. Use it when you need it. Call J.G. Wentworth today. Call 866-393-4970. Nowadays, you got to have plastic. That's where Green Dot comes in. You don't even need a bank account. You can use it anywhere. You can use Visa or MasterCard. You load it so you control it. It's a MasterCard or Visa debit card. No overdrafts, no penalties. It's easy to get. Easy to use. Not by Get all those TV offers. Get cash from ATM. Pay bills over the phone. With my Green Dot card. It's a lot safer than walking around with cash. You lose your card? Green Dot gives you back all the cash you lost. Protects my money? Green Dot prepaid reloadable MasterCard and Visa cards. Available at your neighborhood stores. And the video is in of Spectre dancing a jig at his castle with his wife post-hung jury. We're going to show it to you in exactly 90 seconds. There's a place called Hidden Valley, where kids not only eat their vegetables, they can't get enough. Hidden Valley Ranch makes vegetables delectable. I'm Mark Goldston, Chairman and CEO of Net Zero. All internet providers take you to the same internet, so why pay more to get there? Net Zero is only $9.95 a month, and we give you a 30-day money-back guarantee. Call 1-800-NET-ZERO or visit netzero.com. Hey, there's that Bamzoo spot. Oh, I love Bamzoo.com. Bamzoo has many of the great products advertised on Turner Broadcasting. It's easy to shop online. No run into stores or remembering phone numbers. Just log on. You know, we could do a Bamzoo commercial. You think? Across the street? Uh, sure. Why not? Thanks. You're welcome. Welcome back to Banfield and Ford Courtside. I said it 90 seconds ago. I'm delivering it right now. This is the video just in of the Alhambra Castle just after the mistrial was declared. It is Rochelle and Phil dancing a bit of a jig. 
and doing the victory sign up to the helicopter, the news helicopter that was above. This is courtesy KNBC, as you see in your upper right. Got the bodyguards also joining in with the victory signs. Yes, hi. Yes, we see you. Hello. Hello, Rochelle. Dancing. Well, I don't know how long you're going to be dancing because you're, or humping for that matter. Yes, I, I knew Dominic did tell me, but I guess I didn't want to believe it till I saw it. Uh, and hugging because this is probably going to happen all over again. So cherish this uh, free time uh, while you have it. Hug as many as you can, because who knows what the outcome next time around will be in this case. If anything, though, let me say this, folks. At least we know more about Phil Spector today than we did before April. That was when he was just a legend and a hero and a music producer and an impresario in the music industry. Now we know he's mean. He's a mean SOB who threatens women, pushes them around and sticks guns in their faces. And not just women, a bunch of celebrities too. Leonard Cohen, John Lennon, Yoko Ono, for crying out loud, the list goes on and on. Guys at Starbucks, bell caps, people who park cars, all of these people have the same experience. They can't all be lying, can they? At least we know a little bit more about Phil Spector today. So lock up your folks, lock up your loved ones, lock up your children if Phil Spector's in the neighborhood. He's a free man, for now. And we all know what he's capable of doing and what he's capable of behaving, even though there was no guilty conviction in this case. Um, Beth, Karis, my dear, did you see that video? And if you did, uh, does it surprise you, given we've had so little reaction from these people for the last five months? Well, you know, it doesn't surprise me because they're an unpredictable couple. Um, and I've just seen things throughout the trial, and I'm aware of things that Rochelle has said in the hallway to Dominic Dunn, things she has said to me. So, no, it doesn't surprise me. And it is a victory for them, of course, because he's free. Um, million dollars bail, but he is free until the next trial. Uh, and, and so that must be a huge relief to him um, because he could have been incarcerated as of yesterday had it been a 12-0 uh, guilty verdict. He would have gone in immediately pending sentence and transport to state prison where he would have faced probably 25 years to life. Yeah, I mean, I so, remember Beth saying yeah, he better be checking the yogurt in his fridge as he waits for that verdict to come in, if it did come in at all, which of course it didn't. Let me get Ben Pesta in as well, because as the defense attorney on this panel, Mr. Pesta, um, I, I can't imagine you'd be pleased to see this kind of behavior from uh, a defendant who is still charged, still on bail, and a woman is still dead. I want my clients to be aware that they are being observed every second in the restroom, in the court cafeteria, on the way home, that people are likely to look at them and to talk about what they say and what they do. Having said that, this little celebration ceremony at the house under the helicopter camera, it's entirely logical and entirely expectable. Of course they were relieved. Of course Phil Spector's relieved that he's not going to die in prison. Who wouldn't be? But hi, wait, we don't know that yet. All he has is a reprieve at this juncture. Things could get ugly down the road. Let me ask you, Shelley Alpert, I am disgusted by seeing this. And if I were a juror the next time round, if I were privy to this, I'd be thinking, differently oh. about the material coming into this case absolutely. and his respect for the victim in this case. Can they bring a video like this into a case coming forward no, or not? No, absolutely. no, no, not absolutely. I, I just can't see the relevance, why it would be relevant in any in any fashion and all, why it would be rele relevant evidence as to what happened back in 2003 when Lana died. But I completely agree with Ben. When you have a client on trial, you tell him they are watching you every step. They are watching you walk in the court. They're watching you walk out. They're watching you in the parking lot. You have to, you, you have to be on your best behavior. Don't say a word. Word, just on yeah. the on the and don't hump thing. your no, boyfriend don't or your husband. Hump anybody, that's craziness. Ugh. And you know what? I'm sure that his attorney said, "Look, it ain't over, buddy. You got to keep it down. You know, keep it on the down low, or whatever they're telling him." When he walked out of that courtroom that day, and he obviously didn't listen. I mean, granted, you know, I, I respect what Ben had to say. He's happy. He's elated. You know, at least he's got some kind of reprieve. But this is not over. He's he's not over. And future jurors are watching him on TV and watching that video. And that precisely, is a disgrace. Precisely 
precisely it's a my point. If it's a big enough story to hire a helicopter and fly overhead, a lot of people in your community who will be jurors of right. your peers, uh, they're going to be watching that. And Absolutely. that's not something you're going to forget about. And I could see that maybe even on the cover of the LA Times. Like, who is this guy to dance a jig? Not necessarily over the grave of Lana Clarkson, but despite the grave yeah. of, of Lana Clarkson. Beth Karras, come back to me for a moment, if you will, and let me know that uh, after you're done with me today, you're going to toss out your file, at least for now, pack your bag, come home, <laughs> and at least get your mind onto something else until we send you back. You know, I haven't had my summer vacation yet, and it's the ninth month of the year, and I've been on the road for seven and a half months. I've oh, been away Lord. from New York for seven and a half months in, in 2007. So. You know, it's always kind of sad when the case ends, though, especially when I've been in a place for a long time. And throughout this trial, there have been moist eyes in that courtroom periodically, and there were yesterday, but for different reasons. So, you know, it's, it is, it's going to be hard to leave, but it'll be good to come home. Well, I, for one, have missed you terribly. Um, I love you on TV, but I love you even better when you're in the office yeah. next door to me. So I'm looking forward to seeing you. And I've been thanking the jurors for their service, and I have got to thank you, too, because you have worked your tail, your tiny little tail off. And uh, we sure appreciate it, Beth. And God bless you. I can't wait to see you at home. Thank you. Also want to say thank you to Ben Pesta, who is out there, who has been helping us to navigate through this trial. Thank you, Ben. Look forward to seeing you in person sometime soon. And also Shelly Albert, who was kind enough to come in and navigate through with, uh, and, and be as shocked as I was. I always love it when you agree <laughs> with me. But we'll see you uh, on the next trial. Thank you, Shelly. In the meantime, it's time now to check in with our very own Star Jones, find out what's coming up next on her show. Hey, Star. Hi, Ashley. Boy, we have some heartbreaking but important stories to tell you about today. Police in Nevada are hoping to identify a young girl who was sexually assaulted by an adult male, and it's all captured on videotape. It is absolutely sickening, but we need the audience's help to put the monster behind bars. Plus, there's some major movement in Gina, Louisiana this very afternoon and we have the latest developments. And I'll also tell you about a really brutal murder in North Carolina. A 12-year-old girl is killed in what looks like a burglary gone wrong. We have the facts, and I'll talk to the family's pastor. Those stories and more coming up in just a few minutes. All right, Star, I know you'll do that one justice. Thank you, ma'am. And in the meantime, uh, i got to say goodbye. I'm Ashley Banfield, and for Jack Ford, who's off today, I'll be back here tomorrow at 1 o'clock to, uh, to continue the mission to get people to think reasonably. Be reasonable. That's all we ask. It's just a little itty bitty request. But in everything you do, and God, if you become a juror, please be reasonable. We'll see you tomorrow. Star Jones is now on.